How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here and welcome back to the channel. So after a week off, it's time to go back to Generation 5. My first completed Nuzlocke, both personally and on this channel, was the one that I did with water types for Black 2, so I figured why not go for Part 1. Should be fun, right? After all, we've only got Gen 5 Pokemon for this run, a total of 156 Pokemon minus Legendaries, so any type I choose, it's probably going to be a bit of a difficult time. At first, I wanted to go with Grass types, but then I realized that you don't get a choice of Elemental Monkey in the Dream Yard, nor do you get access to the Pinwheel Forest and any of the good Grass types in there until after you beat Lenora, something that just was not possible with a single Servine at the level cap. So I decided to hunt for another type, one that would give me the possibility of having more than one member on the team by the second gym, and preferably one that would also give me the opportunity to have a full team at some point in the game. So I decided on the flying type. The encounters available here are Pidove on Route 3, which I'll be substituting in using the Universal Pokemon Randomizer as my starter, Woobat in Wellspring Cave, Sigilyph in Desert Resort, Archon from the Fossil in Relic Castle, Emolga from Route 5, Ducklet from Driftvale Drawbridge, and Volibee from Route 10. Seven encounters, one of which is after the 8th gym, just slightly over a full team, meaning I have to ensure that I do not make dumb mistakes if I want to go into the last few battles of the game with a full team. As always, the rules for this challenge are in the description. Can I do it? Well, after you guys smash that like button and subscribe, since we're less than 5,000 subscribers away from 100,000, that's crazy, then you'll find out. So the beginning of the game isn't that slow compared to later games, but man, they really do always shove a bit of tutorial at the beginning of every Pokemon game, haven't they? Well, here at least I can get straight down to business with the first two rival battles. I replaced Oshawott with Pidove, giving Bianca Tepig and Charon Snivy. They're both easy KOs with a few gusts, letting me grab the Pokedex, naming my Pidove Lyralisk in the process. I'm still on a Yu-Gi-Oh craze, what can I say? And I moved on to Route 1. We've got a battle in Accumula Town against N, so I figured doing some Eevee training here would be the best idea. I can only get attack Eevees here against the Patrats and Lillipups, but thanks to only taking down level 2s, I'm able to get a pretty decent amount of them, getting to level 10 and taking out N's level 7 Purloin with ease. The level cap for this section also is 14, so I should be able to come back and nab a few more Eevees from here, but also on Route 2, there are level 4 Purloins that provide speed Eevees that I'll have to get a few of in preparation for the first gym. But before we get there, we've got two more rival battles to take care of. The first of which is at the end of Route 2 against Bianca, who leads off with Lillipup. I bash it in a few times with Gust, hitting two of them for just shy of the KO as she lands two tackles, healing with a potion afterwards. Not to worry, as I can still KO pretty easily with a few more Gusts, leaving just Tepig. I got the level up on this battle too, giving me the advantage as I now have Gust and Quick Attack. Those are able to finish off Tepig very easily, winning me the fight. The second rival battle with Charon is in the Trainer School in Striaton City straight after, so after some healing, he leads off with Snivy as I go for Pidove, who's level 13, meaning it's a two-shot even through an Orenberry to KO and lead into his own Purloin. Gus does just over half as he uses Vine Whip thanks to assist, worst move it could get, but that lets me follow up with a second Gust to KO and win the bout. He gives me Orin Berries in response, very useful items at the beginning of the game here. I'm definitely going to be holding one of those on Pidove for the gym. Silent's going to be battling us since I swapped for Oshawa, and I know people are going to give me crap for giving the first gym and Charon some Pokemon that are weak to flying types, but come on. A. Pidove isn't available till Route 3, so it's not like it really matters for the first gym, and, well, Charon's gonna have a Simisage if I decide to give him any other starter anyway, so who cares? Anyway, Silent leads off with a Lillipup at level 12, so I just go for Quick Attack. He sets up Work Up and hits a single bite as I get him into Potion range, but that's not enough to heal him out of range of two more Quick Attacks, KOing him and leading into Pansage. I don't have a physical flying type move yet, but I did just learn Air Cutter, which does around half. Sadly, the move does not hit that same range again, as Pansage survives, but Salon does not have another potion. Salon, Silen, who frickin' knows, letting Pansage go down and win me the trio badge. Alright, one down, let's just see if I don't get walled by Lenora though. 
After handling the Team Plasma Grunts in the Dream Yard and getting the useless Sea Gear, I'm finally able to head into Route 3 where I would normally get pit of, but a little further up is the Wellspring Cave, where after handling more Team Plasma Grunts, I am able to get my second encounter in Woobat, a psychic flying type that evolves by friendship, meaning we're going to have a fully evolved Pokemon before Lenora, and that is going to be super sweet and give me an edge against her watch out. Unfortunately, Pidove is like the worst of the uh, Route 1 birds out of every region since it evolves at level 21, and seeing as the level cap is level 20, I'm gonna be stuck with it for another dim battle. I named Woobat Simorg, keeping up with the Yu-Gi-Oh! Winged Beast theme, makes sense after all. There's a battle with N right in front of the gym, and he's a relative pushover with his team here, as his Pidove, Timple, and Timber all fall into a few quick attacks apiece, getting me into the gym, clearing out the trainers, and ensuring that I have the EVs necessary to take on Lenora. Sadly, there is no source of special attack EVs yet in the game. The first instance of those are actually Maractus in the Desert Resort, meaning we're gonna have to wait a while on Swoobat's offense. But that's fine, since being a speedy, fully evolved Pokemon at this time should be enough to give me the edge. Lenora leads off with Herdier as I go with Pit of, absorbing the Intimidate and using Roost to hold off Herdier's takedown, letting it damage itself, waste Lenora's Super Potion, and get in some quick attacks whenever it misses. Once I felt it was safe, I swapped for Swoobat, going for Confusion and taking out Herdier with two shots and some takedown recoil. This leaves Swoobat with low HP, but that's fine since Pit of's still at full. Watchog gets flinched by the 30% chance that Heart Stamp provides, letting me get a swap over to Pidove, taking a crunch for under half, then hitting three quick attacks through a missed hypnosis and a retaliate that takes me down to 9 HP, KOing and taking the victory, as well as a newly evolved Tranquil. That'll definitely be helpful for the next gym. With the basic badge in hand, there aren't any noble battles aside from a bunch more Team Plasma Grunts before taking on Berg's gym. So let's just jump into that battle. He leads with Warlipede as they go with Tranquil, using Air Cutter for half as he nails a Poison Tail for 12 damage. This lets me follow up with the second Air Cutter to KO, with Dwebble coming out second. The only Rock-type move this thing has is Smackdown, however, I've planned just for this. See, I have both Detect and Roost on Tranquil now, which has exactly 15 power points, enough to drain Dwebble while also whittling him down whenever I have high enough HP to survive critical hits. This also wastes a few of his healing items, and this strategy works perfectly, as I still have one more Detect and three Roosts left as he shifts into Feint Attack, giving me plenty of room to heal up one more time with Roost and take him out with Air Cutter, leaving just Levani. He did get a Sand Attack off before it came in though, which is a bit rough, but apparently it doesn't matter as Levani goes down to a single critical Air Cutter, annihilating it and winning me the fight. Can't say I was expecting the ace to go down so easily, but I guess that's what happens when you use the type that's four times effective on it. Kinda helpful. So, unlike between the basic and insect badges, we've actually got two more rival battles to take care of before having to worry about Elisa. Again, why is it that I keep choosing types in Gen 5 that make me almost guaranteed to lose to Elisa? Well, anyway, Bianca leads off with Herdier, giving me flashbacks, but nothing Swoobat can't handle. Infusion and Air Cutter are enough to put it down, as she only decided to use Odor Sleuth for some reason, leading into Pig Knight. Yeah, now it's a fighting type and I've got the advantage on both rivals. The big brain plays pay off. Swoobat is easily able to take it down into the red with Air Cutter, letting her use a Super Potion twice as two more Confusions take out Pig Knight, leaving just two more Pokemon. Next down is Pan Sage, a one-shot with Air Cutter, of course, leaving just Muna, who goes down after using Yawn because of Air Cutter and Assurance. Thankfully, before Swoobat could fall asleep, winning me the battle. Well, she wasn't terrible at all, but Charon should be a little bit harder, considering we'll be taking Sandstorm damage the entire time. He leads with Pit of as I go with Swoobat, going for Confusion and getting him into the red, before swapping into Tranquil. I figured he was going to go for Roost, giving me a free turn to do the swap, getting an Air Cutter off to KO and lead into Panpour. This thing's no match for an Air Cutter and Quick Attack combination, which then leads into Limepert. But this one's got Pursuit, so I've got to be careful, but then again, Swoobat wants nothing to do with this fight anyway, so why would I switch? So I just do some Detect and Roost stall shenanigans to keep my HP high enough 
letting the sandstorm damage through the heavy lifting as an air cutter is enough to KO, leaving just Servine. It goes immediately for Leech Seed, which is fair to keep up the HP during Sandstorm, but since Tranquil's also under Torment thanks to Lyperd, I figured I'd swap back into Swoobat, hitting a Confusion and one more Air Cutter to pick up the KO in the victory. Not too bad, and now I can access my third and fourth encounters. The Desert Resort is home to Sigilith, another Psychic Flying type that is a bit more bulky than Swoobat, which I named Nephthys, and in the Relic Castle I can grab the Fossil for... Ew. I, uh, accidentally grabbed the wrong fossil! Don't mind me, though, I just beat up the backpacker for the other one and revived Archon in the Nacreen Museum, naming it Raid Raptor. There's still one more encounter to capture before the next gym, but before that, I've got to take out the Plasma Grunts, get the bike, and have another battle with N all in Nimbasa City before getting it. Fortunately, this battle is a little bit more involved and worth talking about compared to the last two N fights. He leads with Sandile, so I go with Tranquil, immediately firing Air Cutter for a little under half as he uses Embargo. I guess he wanted to more efficiently enforce one of my own rules, I guess. He goes down to a quick attack, with Darumaka taking its place, and holy moly these things are scary with their high physical attack and hustle ability, so I've gotta be careful here. Quick attack does under half, whereas Fire Punch does over half to me, so I swapped into Archon to get that resistance off here. But thanks to Hustle, he misses, giving me a free switch. We both waste a turn by missing Rock Tomb and Fire Punch respectively, but next turn he lands Fire Punch for under half as I miss Rock Tomb again. Thankfully, I'm not under Archon's Defeatist ability just yet, though, which halves all stats once under half HP, so I go for Rock Tomb a third time, and we both miss again! Am I using Rock Tomb, or am I using Fissure? I can't tell! The fourth time's the charm, though, finally landing it and KOing Darumaka, leading into his Scraggy. I figured I'd swap here, no reason to keep a Rock-type in against a Fighting-type, going into Sigilyph and KOing with an Air Cutter, leaving just the mirror match of the weird, unknown, connected to Egyptian bird things. I don't know. He sets up Tailwind, but that's his downfall, as two Air Cutters, one of which being a crit, are enough to put him down, winning me the match. Not bad at all. I was worried a little bit about this fight, but I really shouldn't have been. Anyway, with that out of the way, it's finally time to head into the gym, take out all of the trainers in there before heading over to Route 5, and into some rustling grass in order to get my fifth encounter in Amolga, who is going to have to put in some heavy lifting for Elisa. I name it Garunix, and after doing some math with the Gen 5 EXP calculator, since I didn't feel like actually EV training my Pokemon, that takes too much time, I was able to calculate how many EVs I could get for each of my Pokemon without overleveling, which was really helpful, seeing as three of my party members need special attack EVs, and with the lowest thing being Maractus at level 20, being able to divide the EXP into all three of them was really important for this fight. Elisa leads off with her first Emolga, so I go with my own, using Charge to defend against Elisa's Volt Switch, then setting up a few double teams on the second Emolga as it tries hitting a variety of attacks, finally landing a Volt Switch as the first Emolga comes back in. I did give my own Emolga some physical attack EVs too, giving it plenty enough to KO both Emolgas, the first with one return, and the second with two after using a held Cherry Berry to heal from static. All that's left is Zepstrika, but I still have 5 double teams up, so I figured I'd keep going for return, hitting 2 of them without getting hit myself for just shy of the KO, letting Elisa heal up with a Hyper Potion afterwards. But thanks to some lucky ranges, I'm finally able to KO with 2 more returns, taking out Zepstrika and winning the fight with just Emolga. Not having to put the rest of the team in the line of fire is definitely convenient here, though there was always the chance that something hit through double team and took out Emolga, and a few things did, but not enough to actually take it out. With the bolt badge in hand though, we've got 4 down and 4 to go. Straight out on Route 5, we've got another rival battle against Charon, and he leads off with Lyperd. I went for Tranquil, immediately going for Return after getting hit with Fake Out, KOing in one shot and leading to Panpour. And it happens to just about everything. Panpour and his own Trank will go down to one return each, leaving just Servine to be the only one who survives a return, but he misses a Leaf Tornado, letting me escape this battle damageless with a second return KOing Servine. Well, that's great. Now I can go onto the Drift Veil Drawbridge and finally finish the last spot of my team. I captured Ducklet, which will be a great help in the next gym. 
The cold storage is up next, bunch of random battles and team plasma grunts. Nothing we haven't seen before, so I just sweep them out, letting me get into the gym and take out the trainers in there. Unfortunately, the level cap doesn't let Ducklet evolve until the next gym, unlike in Black 2, White 2 challenge mode, where I could, but I think that makes it a little bit more entertaining. After all, who wouldn't want to watch a small duck absolutely destroy an Excadrill? Clay leads off with Crocorock, so I of course go with Ducklet, KOing it immediately with Scald and leading into Excadrill. Ducklet outspeeds and nails a Scald for over half, burning it while Excadrill wastes its turn, setting up Hone Claws, letting me get off a second to KO, with Palpitoad being the only Mon remaining. I just kept clicking on Scald though, and hilariously, the first shot on Palpitoad also burned it, so I just kept wailing on it afterwards with Aerial Ace, getting through both of its Hyper Potions before swapping out for Tranquil, taking a Muddy Water for around half before swapping into Swoobat. It also takes around half, so I swap into a Molga to avoid crit potential, which also doesn't work, so I finally go into Sigilyph, who takes around a quarter from Muddy Water, letting me follow up with Psybeam to KO, winning the fight, and evolving Tranquil into Unpheasant. Well, that'll be useful, I'm sure. Return has definitely been a fantastic move, and it's been making me wish I had more physical attackers on this team. Just like the last batch, straight out on Route 6 is a battle against Bianca, who's got a better team than Sharon in my opinion. She leads off with Herdier as I go with Archon, taking the Intimidate but disregarding it as I go for Acrobatics, nearly KOing and getting through both of her Hyper Potions, KOing after the 4th and leading into Pan Sage. Of course, Acrobatics destroys it just as well, leading into Misharna, who I just go for Acrobatics on as well. Doing over half as she misses with Hypnosis, so I go for a second to KO, leaving just Pig Knight to go down to a single Acrobatics as well, winning me the fight. <laughs> <laughs> I did not expect Archon to do that so easily. Once that thing evolves, I feel like I'm gonna have an unstoppable force on this team. I've never used an Archon or Archeops before, and I honestly had no idea just how hard it could hit stuff. With this though, I'm finally given the HM for Fly, so of course I give it to Unpheasant as my normal type physical attacker. You know, it's gonna be pretty good matched with Return. Carrying on through Route 6 and Charge Stone Cave before coming up to the end, challenging N once again. He leads off with Boldor, which is a little bit of a problem because it has Sturdy, so I was hoping that with Ducklet I could burn it with Scald so that it would just go down in one turn anyway, and so that Smackdown wouldn't do a boatload of damage, but it doesn't burn. But it doesn't KO Ducklet either, so that's fine, letting Ducklet follow up with a second Scald to KO, leading into Joltik. I, of course, am swapping out here, going into Amolga and going for Return twice, KOing through a few Electrowebs that slow down Amolga. Third out is Clink, though, and I think I gotta switch out so that I can recover my speed, going into Unpheasant and taking a Charge Beam for exactly one-fifth of my HP before going for Return for half, KOing next turn with another one after taking a second Charge Beam. Last out is Pharaoh Seed, and this thing is, should be easily handled with Fly and Roost. Sadly though, it does have Iron Defense and the ability Iron Barbs, but that doesn't really matter after my second fly ends up getting a critical, destroying Pharaoh Seed and End Steam once again. Ah yes, another opportunity to use the Staples button that I have not yet purchased. That was easy. <laughs> With this defeat, I'm able to access Mistralton City, but not quite the gym yet. I've got to go to the top of Celestial Tower before I get to do that. I don't want to quite go that way yet though, since there's still a little bit of like experience and money that I want to pick up from around the region, since I've been skipping a boatload of trainers in order to not go over the level cap, and so that I could EV train. Now that everything's basically taken care of though, I figured I'd just go for that money. Then going back to Route 7 in Celestial Tower to get Slyla to go back into her gym, but I'm not going in there yet because Miss Dalton City is the home of the Move Tutor. So after grinding up some heart scales, I made sure to reteach my Pokemon some new moves and give them some other TMs before going into the battle against her. She leads with Swoobat, so I did the same. And since I visited that move relearner, I've got a great strategy here. I led with Attract, holding Swoobat down from attacking quite a bit as I set up three Calm Mines, hitting an Air Slash to bring her Swoobat down into the red, forcing her into a Hyper Potion while I get one more free Calm Mind up, KOing next turn after outspeeding with Air Slash as her Unpheasant takes the field second. Quick Attack doesn't do much as I KO with a single Air Slash, leaving just Swanna. 
Now, I debated whether I should stay in or not here, as it all depends on if she decides to go for Aqua Ring instead of attacking, but Swoobat only has a third of its HP remaining, so I feel like it's going to see a KO, so swapping is likely the smartest decision. I sent out Sigilyph, and she went for Aqua Ring. Well, I guess I would have lucked out, but I'm better off just wailing on Swanna with Psybeam, hitting three of them through a second Hyper Potion before being too low HP to continue. So I swapped again into my own newly evolved Swanna, taking a few Aerial Aces before firing back with two Air Slashes, finally picking up the Knockout, and the win, and the Jet Badge. Six badges in, no deaths, that's great, but... I still have two more badges before I can even get a backup party member in case anything does go downhill. As with the last two badges now, we've got a rival battle immediately before entering Twist Mountain. Or was it three badges? Four? Who knows at this point, but this time Charon's leading with his newly evolved Unfezen. I do the same, immediately going for Detect since I'm expecting the same from him. I'm correct, nailing a return next turn for around 80% as his Air Slash does next to nothing, KOing next turn with another return and leading to Simipor. I figured I'd had ample time to use Roost here, but of course Skull does a boatload and burns, so I guess Unfezen's gonna be useless for the remainder of this fight. But that's fine as Swana can just come in and hit it with a few Air Slashes. This doesn't even KO though, since Simipore manages to burn again with Scald, so I swap into Amolga, taking a Scald for a near KO before firing off a Volt Switch, going into Sigilyph and taking it out. Dumb idea by the way, since he just sends in Lipard to counter me, but I said screw it, flinching to his fake out then going for Air Cutter next turn for over half, forcing him to use a Citrus Berry as he sets up Bone Claws. Well, I guess the risk paid off as a second air cutter lands and does manage to KO, but Lipard was able to outspeed and put Sigilyph under Torment, meaning that Servine will have an extra turn to live. Seeing as he only sets up Leech Seed on the turn I'm forced to Psybeam, going down next turn to air cutter and winning me the fight. This gives me access to the HM for Surf, but I don't want to slap it on Swanna just yet since Scald has been doing a lot better work for me lately. It's almost like the burn does a lot of damage. I'll have to put it on there eventually though, and I'm not looking forward to it. Twist Mountain is full of trainers, and again, plasma grunts. Weird, it's almost like they're copy-pasting things with different dialogue. At the end, of course, is Icarus City, or Osiris, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, who, Nick, who cares, the home of the 7th Gym Leader, Bryson. I'm kind of scared of him, to be completely honest, since I don't have a good way of handling ice types like I do electric types in Amoga. I at least do have my newly evolved Archeops though, which should be able to outspeed, it just depends on if I can land a rock type move without it missing over and over again, and still having Rock Tomb, I don't think it's going to be a reliable strategy, so I'm not going to go with that. His trainers don't really stand a chance thanks to me being able to give Sigil a flash cannon, and thanks to a little collision detection problem in the gym, I'm able to avoid one of his trainers, giving me less risks before taking on Bryson himself. He leads with Vanillish as I go for Emolga first, setting up Light Screen only to be taken to 3 HP thanks to a Frost Breath, a move that always criticals. Fortunately, that wasn't disastrous, so I swapped into Swanna thanks to Volt Switch, doing around half as Swan is able to KO with Scald, leading to Bear Tick. I managed to set up an Aqua Ring as he missed Swagger, hitting his Scald next turn and burning his Icicle Crash did around a quarter of Swanna's HP. Next turn I land a Critical Scald, taking out Bear Tick and leaving just Cryogonal. Now this thing has a very massive special defense stat, so it's going to take a little bit to take down. Scald does around a third surprisingly, I thought it was going to do less, and burns again somehow, so I just let the burn take hold for a turn as I heal up with Roost, taking some Aurora Beams before nailing one more Scald, bringing him into KO range with the burn, taking Cryogonal down and giving me the Icicle Badge. Seven down, one to go, no deaths, I'm feeling good. So I immediately thought for the next gym, oh, I can just teach Swana Ice Beam and sweep through all of the dragon types. Where do I get that TM? Turns out it's in the giant chasm, same location as Black and White 2. Great, now I can't get it for the entirety of this challenge, and none of my team learns any other ice type moves. However, Archeops does get access to Dragon Claw and Dragon Tail. Sadly for me though, the former is only accessible by either level up at level 56, something we'll never be able to do in this challenge, or by TM from the Victory Road, so that's not an option just yet. And the latter is the TM given to us by Drayden upon his defeat, which at that point, it'll practically be useless. So we're just gonna have to use some good ol' strategy to take him down. 
Firstly though, I have to do some story. Go through Dragon Spiral Tower, take out Plasma Grunts. Go to Relic Castle, take out Plasma Grunts. Go back to Nacreen Museum, thank god I don't have to take out Plasma Grunts. Finally letting me progress. In the middle of all that though, I finally went out of my way to grab the EXP share from Castalia City, since I really haven't had the free opportunity to do so thanks to earlier level caps and EV training. Anyway, at the end of Route 8 is another rival battle. Thankfully, Bianca's not too bad here though. She kicks off with her newly evolved Stoutland, so I went up with Archeops, nailing two acrobatics to KO since she decided to waste a turn with Workup. Simisage comes out second, acrobatics bye, Asharna, two crunches, bye, Ambor, acrobatics, see ya chump. Two Blind Bridge doesn't have anything for me, neither does Route 9, so let's just jump into the gym, shall we? Sadly, I finally had a fatal mistake where a Trainer's Dredigan was able to take out my Unpheasant with a critical Dragon Claw. This was totally preventable seeing as I outsped Drudigan and did way more than half with Return last turn, but hey, it's only one KO and once we're done with Drayden, I'll be able to get my last encounter straight away and fill up my team once again. Drayden leads with Fracture as I go with Archeops, going for Acrobatics and KOing in one shot leading to Drudigan. Acrobatics is once again the move of choice, but it doesn't quite get the job done. Instead, Drudigan is able to nail a Night Slash for less than half, but I'm able to nail a Rock Tomb on the turn he heals, using one more Acrobatics to KO and leave just Haxorus. I swapped into Swana here, getting Dragon Tailed out into a Molga, so I figured I'd Encore him into it, which ended up working out great as Static paralyzes him as he drags out Swana once again with Dragon Tail. Return does over half of the critical as Amolga gets dragged out once again, so I go for Volt Switch to get out, but that doesn't work. It doesn't even KO, even though it's at such low HP, bringing him into the red as Dragon Tail swaps Sigilyph back out for Amolga. As he heals, I Volt Switch again, going into Swoobat, and then going for Psychic for half of his remaining HP as Encore ends. This allows him to go into any move he chooses, and for some reason he decides to go for Dragon Dance, which ends up being his downfall since he's still paralyzed, which in turn lets Swoobat follow up with a second Psychic to KO and secure the Legend Badge. Sweet, no more losses, I'll have a full team again in no time. Immediately after the gym, I'm given the Master Ball by Juniper, so I figured I'd go ahead and find myself a Volibee and use it. Why not, right? There's no other encounters. Well, technically, none that are usable at least. I nicknamed it Blackwing, Damage Step Kalut, anybody? After giving it the EV spread and EXP that it needs, it's time for the final rival battle of the run. It's against Charon, and he leads off with Unpheasant, so I go for Archeops, hard countering it by hitting it with Rock Tomb on the fourth turn as he uses Detect, I miss on the second turn as he uses Taunt, and Detect again. Fun times, am I right? Rock Tomb doesn't quite get the KO though, but it does lower his speed as Air Slash does next to nothing, so I just started going for Acrobatics, KOing not next turn thanks to another Detect, but the turn after, leaning into Simipore. Acrobatics runs right through it, KOing in one shot, leading to Superior, and while I'm sure Acrobatics can take it out just fine, I swapped into Swoobat here so that I could use Thief, since I wanted to take his held leftovers. After KOing it with an Air Slash and Psychic, then KOing Lyperd with a few of Volibee's Air Slashes and Swan is Surf, winning the fight, I checked my party and realized that the leftovers were not on Swoobat anymore. He didn't have them. And that's because apparently they changed the way that you could take items with Thief in Generation 5. In Gens 2 through 4, you could take them off of random trainers and wild Pokemon, but in Gen 5 onward, you can only take them from wild Pokemon. I was very disappointed by this because leftovers would have been really nice on something like Volibee and eventually Mana Buzz, but alas, I moved into the victory road, doing well until one of the penultimate trainers manages to KO my Swoobat with a friggin' clang. I really would have rather seen Sigilyph go down instead because Swoobat has Calm Mind and is pretty fast so we can set up, but I guess we can't have everything we want. I'm only left with 5 Pokemon for the rest of the run, but the Elite 4 members all have 4 apiece, so that should be easy enough. Though N and Getz's have 6 each, so I'm gonna be in a tight spot for the last few battles. Do you think I can make it through without doing another attempt? Leave a comment down below, and if you think I can, how many Pokemon will I lose? Let's find out. So of course, I did some preparations, got the TMs I needed, gave my Pokemon the right movesets, got plenty of type-specific gems, grabbed all of the available rare candies around the region, and got them to the Elite 4 level cap of 50. 
I'm looking at Sigilyph with Air Slash, Shadow Ball, Hypnosis, and Psychic. Archeops with Acrobatics, Rock Slide, Crunch, and Earthquake. Emolga with Thunderbolt, Volt Switch, Encore, and Acrobatics. Swana with Scald, Air Slash, Return, and Roost. And last but not least, Volibi with Nasty Plot, Air Slash, Dark Pulse, and Hidden Power. Which just so happens to be the Rock type. Figured it would be nice just in case Archeops goes down throughout this run. Let's do it. First up on the list is Shantal, who leads with Kafa Grigus. I started with Sigilyph, going straight for a Ghost Gem boosted Shadow Ball that brings her into the red, as her own Shadow Ball does around two thirds. She heals, letting me get off two more to KO, leading to her second member in Jellicent. Sigilyph's done for this fight, so I swap into Amolga, tanking a Shadow Ball and using an Electric Gem boosted Volt Switch to get into Volibee, setting up a Nasty Plot and tanking a Surf before KOing with Dark Pulse. Half of her team remains as Chandelure comes in third and nails a big fire blast to nearly KO my Volibee, but Dark Pulse is able to KO on the crackback, in one shot leaving just Golurk. It's slow as hell though, so an outsped plus two Dark Pulse is plenty to take it out, winning me the fight. I thought that it was a bit too aggressive there, maybe I should take it easy with the next three fights and plan a little more accordingly, maybe take a little bit more time. Second is Grimsley, starting with Scrafty as I go with Archeops, taking it out with a Flying Gem boosted Acrobatics, leading to Bisharp, who goes down to a Critical Earthquake. Don't worry, Calx indicated that the crit didn't matter. And yes, I did some Calx for this Elite Four, what, you, what am I gonna do? Third out is Crocodile, who takes over half from Acrobatics, but Foul Play is able to take Archeops down to below half, effectively making it useless thanks to Defeatist, so I swamp into Swana, tanking a Dragon Claw and firing back with a super effective Scald to KO, leaving just Wyperd. After a fake out though, it's a bit of a war of attrition, full restores versus Roost, Night Slash versus Scald, but eventually Swan is able to come out on top thanks to a high range Scald that burned, KOing with the burn damage and letting me walk away with the W. Third on the list is Caitlyn, who I anticipated would probably be the easiest member to take down for my team. She leads off with Reuniclus, an infamously slow Pokemon, so I go with Volibi, setting up a nasty plot and dodging Thunder, KOing with Dark Pulse as Sigilyph comes in second. Ice Beam does under half as Dark Pulse is able to KO it as well, leading to Gothitel. Evie Light coming in clutch, I guess. Kinda wild that this item is being used in the Elite Four. From here, I figured I'd swap into a Mulga, anticipating a Thunderbolt, but instead Gothitel goes for Calm Mind. Both scenarios, thankfully, were accounted for, as Encore is able to lock her in, giving me time to swap into Archeops and destroy her with a Dark Gem boosted Crunch, as Misharna comes in last. Crunch does around two-thirds, as Psychic does just over half, which kind of makes Archeops useless, but since Mishan is so slow, and Crunch did so much damage the first time, I just went for another Crunch, picking up the KO and the victory against Caitlyn. I probably should have done some swapping and Kato'd it safely, but it wouldn't be a chaotic meatball video without me thinking the funny option, in this case KOing something under Defeatist, is always the better option. Last but not least is Marshall, who you'd think would be the easiest member thanks to him using fighting types, but Stone Edge is indeed a move. Heat leads with Throw as I go with Amolga, hitting a flying gem boosted acrobatics to KO and lead into Sock. This thing has Sturdy, hence why I led with Amolga, since it's the most expendable thing on my team. Thankfully though, I'm rewarded with a dodge Stone Edge, leaving Sock to go down to a few more acrobatics after some more wasted full restores. Half down, half to go as Conkelder comes in third, so I Volt Switch into Sigilyph, tanking a Stone Edge on 18 HP and KOing next turn with the Psychic Gem boosted Psychic, leaving just Mien Chao. These things are ridiculously fast, so I swapped into Omolga once again in the hopes that the boosted Retaliate that it was basically guaranteed to use would paralyze with Static, and thankfully it did. This gives me free reign to swap into Archeops, and he even gets a full para, so I'm able to just go for a Flying Gem boosted Acrobatics to KO, winning the fight. And with that, the Elite Four is toast. No losses, five team members going into Reshram and Ngetsis. I'm feeling pretty good about this. So I think the funniest thing about the whole section between beating the Elite Four and the fights against Reshiram and Ngetsis is the fact that I completely forgot to go grab some Ultra Balls to capture Reshiram, since you're forced to capture it. I was probably better off holding the Master Ball for this to make it a non-factor, but you know, that's what I get for making stupid decisions. But the funny part about this whole thing is, is that I could not for the life of me remember how to get back to the Pokemon Center at the base of Victory Road. It must have taken me a good five minutes or so just going into every room and being like, uh, do you send me back? And then proceeding to tell me no indirectly. 
Either way, I made sure to use all of my rare candies before going into the Reshiram battle, getting four of my five party members to level 54, and evolving my Volibee into Mandibuzz finally, then getting Reshiram in a few Ultra Balls after calculating that Archops' Rock Slide has a few ranges that wouldn't KO, giving me an easy way to capture it without the Master Ball. Of course, though, this wouldn't be a modern Pokemon game without them literally shoving this thing into your party and making it take the first slot, so starting out the battle with N, I just kept throwing Ultra Balls until Reshiram went down to start the battle proper. The last move Zekrom used was Giga Impact, though, so I said, heh <laughs> we do a little trolling, KOing with two of Archeops' Earthquakes, taking out his Ace without taking any damage on my party. I very much appreciate the freebie, but the rest of the team is going to be pretty tough, as well as Getsus' team, since I'm not going to be able to give my Pokemon new items in between these fights. Second up is Vanillux, so Rock Slide is able to KO in one shot, with Caracosta out third. This thing is sturdy, so I swapped into Mandibuzz in case Stone Edge lands, or he goes for Aqua Jet, and thankfully I'm rewarded with another Stone Edge miss, with a Quick Claw activation immediately after giving me a Dark Pulse flinch. Now, I don't want him healing again, and it did slightly under half, so I just went for another nasty plot, leading to another missed stone edge as one more Dark Pulse is able to KO. Three down, three to go, and Archeops is off fourth, doing a ridiculously high amount of damage with stone edge before I am able to land a plus four rock type hidden power that nearly KOs, putting him into defeatist range. So I stay in, and despite him healing, hidden power does the same thing again, bringing him down into the red as stone edge misses once more, letting me take him down. Fifth out is Kling Klang, so I swap for Emolga, taking a thunderbolt for slightly less than half. This turns the end for Emolga though, as an electric gem boosted Thunderbolt nearly KOs, Hyper Beam puts Emolga down for good, though that recovery turn means he can't heal, so I went into Archeops, KOing with Earthquake and leaving just Zoroark. Earthquake is just shy of a KO as he lands Focus Blast for a sliver under half, keeping me over defeatist and allowing another Earthquake to get the KO. Alright, all that's left is Getsus. It's 4 on 6, so it's going to be very difficult, but I think I can do this. My team is healed in between, thankfully, so I just let his Kofagrigus KO both Reshiram and Amolga before starting the battle proper once again. Thankfully, this time without a recovery turn basically making me cheat. With those two out of my hair, though, I went into Archeops, since I can actually make this thing more useful by picking up Mummy off of Crunch. This means I don't have to deal with Defeatist, which was going to be a problem since he went for Toxic, meaning I'm only going to get a few turns out of Archeops, but now I get more thanks to Mummy. Kofagurgus uses Protect next turn as I go for Crunch, taking a bit more poison damage before I'm finally able to put him down with a second Crunch, leading to Bisharp. This one's a range to KO with Earthquake, and of course I miss the range, getting destroyed by a Stone Edge, putting me down 3 to 5. About time a Stone Edge landed, but hey, what are you gonna do? Swan is faster though, and Two Scalds is able to KO through a full restore, putting me closer to evening the score. Third out is Buffalant, and this thing has wild charge. And I figured that this was gonna be Swan's last use, but if I get a burn out of Scald, I'd live. But if I don't, well, this happens. It goes down after doing a third with Scald. It does a ton of recoil damage to itself as I send in Mandibuzz, though. It's bulky enough to live through two wild charges, setting up two nasty plots, and since it outspeeds Buffalant, Dark Pulse is easily able to KO at such low HP, leading into Electros. It outspeeds again, and Dark Pulse gets the flinch, letting me KO it for free, and finally evening out this match with a 2-2 balance. Fifth out is Hydreigon, and I gotta do something to make sure that this thing goes down before Sigilith comes in or this run is over. Thankfully for me, he goes for Focus Blast and misses, letting me get off an Air Slash for 70% before succumbing to the second Focus Blast, leaving just my Sigilith. This is a little worrisome, but Air Slash is able to finish off Hydreigon from this range, making it a one-on-one -on -one between my Sigilith and his Seismitoad. Thankfully, Psychic does over half as he sets up Rain Dance, and though he has the Swift Swim ability, Sigilyph's Eevee trained enough in speed to still land Psychic first, KOing and winning me the battle with my last flying type remaining. I'm gonna tell you now, I was very close to heart palpitations during that last fight. If you put a heart monitor on me, I would have been close to around 150 BPM because it was so stressful I did not want to do this challenge again. But with that, we've successfully put Team Plasma away, winning the challenge. 
Now, I was tempted to do the post Elite Four section going up to Alder, but I'm not about to open my mouth and insert my foot because that last battle was already close enough, and I don't think I'd be able to make it through the post game sections with just Sigilith before finding some new encounters. However, I'll leave it up to you guys in the comments. Would you like me to do up to Alder from now on in Black and White Hardcore Nuzlocks, or would you prefer up to Getsis? Anyway, next time on the channel, we're finally getting to our first Professor Oak's challenge in the Alola region when we take on Sun and Moon. See you guys then. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, click the bell, tell a friend, and don't spend more than a minute doing that, since if you are, you're taking too long. I want to give a huge shout out to my $10 and above patrons, Justin Dimenstein, Aaron Reinsmith, Heimflo, Alexander Abdi, Aiden Brannon, Andy, Casper Kirkpatrick, Jacob Johnson, Kyle Campbell, Michael Evans, Phoenix Fire, and Zeno. Thank you guys so much for your support. If you'd like to support as well, you can head over to my Patreon page, link in the description, where you can get access to stuff like videos early, an exclusive role on my Discord server, link also in the description, challenge requests, and much more. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to watch this, and I'll see you guys next time with another challenge. Stay safe, stay healthy, I'll see you next time.